Friday the 13th. Friday the 13th. November. Get your hockey masks out, MK. It's I know. Friday the 13th. You. It's funny. I saw a meme the other day. It was like Friday the 13th. And then it was like Friday the 13th in 2020. And the guy's face is just like terrified. I'm looking Friday the 13th is gone. bad luck. A Friday the 13th in 2020 is even worse. Well, I'll t- I will tell you that my oldest daughter scholar brought up a very interesting fact the other night she said dad do you know that the last friday the 13th we've had prior to this one was march 13th of the spring right before the pandemic became a major problem oh god so and so now with everything that's been going on and the spikes are starting to go up all over the place i started to kind of freak out a little bit with that i was like oh i hope that's Look at not skyler wow no it's very intuitive of her. Yeah. it also it freaked me out quite a bit though i mean <laughs> talking about this past week we've been virtual all week this past week yeah because yeah. we have we have a spike and uh luckily we just got we just got word that we'll be back in person on monday but uh I tell you, this week was was dicey, bro. This was no. I, I just hope nervous. you know next week. I hope that we get through it. I just feel like this is the way that it's going to be. It's going to be like one day on, two days off, and then back and forth. But uh, like I said, like you said, I'm happy that we're getting back on Monday. Hopefully, you know we could sustain that. I mean, I think I think we're doing. Everybody's doing our best. I think our district is doing the best. I feel like they're not giving up on it. They're not saying, "All right, we're going to be remote until February." Right. We're, which we're kind of holding. Are, we're yeah. kind of holding out hope. And I know it was, it was funny. Like uh, we were in, we were actually in the building a couple of days ago, teaching, uh, even though all the kids were home. And I remember you leaving at the end of the day, you're like, all right, I'll see you in February. <laughs> yeah. oh, that's the way that I felt. That's why I know. It's so I funny kinda, because like, when it all happened in March, I wasn't like that. And I, you know, that Friday rolled around. It was like, you know, in March and I, and we had a feeling that we would be off, but it wasn't going to be, I didn't feel like I was going to say, see in September, which it actually was. Right. Yeah. I felt like it was going to be like, all right, see you in a week, you know, and yeah. this is still, you know, it's just dragging on. So, I know, but I did, I, know, I almost felt that way with this last time. I'm like, oh man, I feel like this past week, I'm like, oh, maybe this is it, you know? Yep. So, got a little, got a little, I think now, that's now what that we uh, got that call. I'm just hoping we don't get that call on Sunday on night. On Sunday say, night. Yep. We're back to remote. Although I, I had to say it was, you know, Teaching from home today, uh, at you know we were you know able to teach at home today. I it was night and day from what it was when this all went down. Yeah, it's I felt, not the same, but it was no, night and day. No. But it did it did feel a little bit more comfortable. Like I knew I had a handle on things. I got nervous though, because in a way I, I said to myself today oh my god that felt too comfortable it felt too smooth for me today i'm like oh my god this could you know we don't want to not we don't want to get have this no become so do become so good at this where it becomes yes (laughs) you know this is still we still want this to be a band-aid and not you know this is not a solution yeah yes for for sure for sure but i guess it it did go smoother today but well, this this week also uh, was not kind to you physically. Oh I God, know. no! What happened? Back. What happened? Yeah, the back went out again. <laughs> it's not good. I hear, I feel you, bro. You this know, you know, welcome, the back pain is. Welcome to my world, my friend. I know. That's it's it. just, it's... I mean, this is like I said when I went to the doctor this week. He's like, it's not good. I'm like, well, why isn't it good? He's like, well, is that an gonna... official diagnosis? Yeah, from well, a that's what he just said. Like, it's not good. He said under... it's. No, because he asked how long my back has been going out for. And I said, I went out for the first time over 10 years ago. And I said, it goes out, I'd say like, you know, it used to be like once a year. 
now it's like twice and now it's like four times a year and he's like it's not good you've been having back pain for over 10 years and you're 38 he's like that's not a good thing so he's like right. you know and he actually just, wrote that in the chart he didn't, not write, he didn't write that in the chart but <laughs> he I actually said it to me i'm like oh damn this guy's straightforward yeah <laughs> could have sugarcoat it a little bit for me no listen you need that you know, but I, I'm feeling better today. I mean, I got uh, muscle relaxers, which I don't even feel like I need. I didn't take any Advil today. I'm on steroids, so if I look you can, a little you stronger, can pass the you can pass the muscle relaxers to me <laughs> yeah. if you want. Them. No, I'm saving those. I'm saving because <laughs> you never know. You know how it is when it, your back goes. Yeah. Down. Oh you no, it's them, the worst. So. It is the worst. Yeah. Most debilitating, and it's scary. Like, like I've I've had back problems since I'm 17. It's uh, it's, it's generic. It's horrible. Uh, I mean, genetic, sorry, it's genetic. It runs in the family. It's, and it's just when, when it hits, man, I mean, my legs go numb. I can't yeah. get up, but it's, it locks you for sometimes yeah. for hours at a time. And I couldn't even like put you, my shoes on. Thank God right. I had my, my Crocs, my new there Crocs. <laughs> Everybody makes fun of these, but I couldn't get socks on and shoes on. So it's like what I've been wearing all week. You got it. It's horrible. Do what you it's the worst do. pain, but yeah. you know. But you I'm got through better it. now. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's good. Well, but, this episode, let me tell you, holy mackerel, with Barbara Earl Thomas. Wow, Barbara um, was amazing. What a classy human being. Like, not just an artist. She's just, she is a, a treasure to know. She really, she really is. is. She is. She was just so warm and forthcoming and sweet and just just a good person. Yeah, I got so many things out of talking, you know, talking with her and really just not even talking, but like just listening to her, yeah. you know, so many things, you know, related to art, but also so many things related to life and related to, you know, my mindset. I feel like I, I learned so much from her in that hour that I'm, you know, that I'm going to take and, and try to think about, you know, day to day. Yeah, and, and especially in the current climate, it was it was so nice to hear her thoughts on things and, and how the African-American community is affected and, and what she feels is, is our way forward. And, and just such what well, like we like to call them such great nuggets, yeah. um, you know, things that we could pull from the conversation that, you know, everybody, I think it doesn't matter what age you are can really, really, you know, come away with. So uh, a lot of episode, important, lot of important art lessons and life lessons and life lessons. Yes. This was one of those episodes where we, we kind of hit the, the buttons on everything. So yeah. Uh, episode 22, let's roll that tape. MK. Here we go. Strap in and enjoy the ride. Okay. We have Miss Barbara Earl Thomas from Seattle, Washington. Barbara, welcome to the drop. Thank you for having me. It was kind of trying getting in, but here I am, and I'm so happy. You made we it. Are, no, you made no concerns. It. We are, no, it's we are so glad to have now. you. Yes, it is a party for sure. Uh, yeah, we had such a great pre-check conversation with Barbara at the beginning of the week. Uh, I have to say, Barbara, honestly, it, it felt like talking to uh, a, a good a friend like an old friend like we just had such a nice conversation with you you were so warm and so welcoming and uh, i mean we talked for almost 45 minutes with you it was yeah. it was just about all kinds of you know wonderful things and you you just were so open and honest with us and we can't wait to to get to the nitty-gritty with you today no, I'm, i'd be real pinned down and really dishonest <laughs> watch out yeah we we uh so we were we were going through your bio and your website early in the week and uh so we want to start right from the from the get-go with what we like to call our artist origin story you know our, mm -hmm. our superhero origin story and and we saw that you are the first in your family to be born outside of louisiana and texas is that correct that's right i'm what and, they call um in japanese it would be i would be nisei Nisei. And what does that mean? That means the first? I think that the first generation born outside of Japan, I'm the first right. generation born outside of the South. Wow. My family. And they, my grandfather came here in the kind of 41, 42 during the war because he heard that Black people could get jobs here and that you could actually own property 
I mean, mm. right. And um, so he got on the train or drove, I'm not quite sure, and came here and got a job at Lockheed or one of the ship scaling um, ventures. And uh, then he sent for my mom and uh, my mom's sister, and they followed. And then my mom, I think my mom was about 16 or 17. And then she got here and she married my dad, who was also, everybody here was somehow involved with the war effort, mm. you know, the service. And so she married my dad, who was in World War II. Uh, she met him from um, Fort Lewis that's here in, in the and Seattle Tacoma area. Right, and here is is in the state of Washington. It so you're is. just you're just yeah. outside of Seattle, Washington, correct? I'm in Seattle, but Tacoma, where my dad was, that's just in Tacoma. That's outside of that's south of Seattle. Right. And um, but you know it was what people did, and my dad, an Earl is his middle name. Right. So oh, okay. He's William Earl, so I'm Barbara Earl, and. Um, oh. So a lot of people in my family have the middle name Earl because he died really young. Mm, and okay. my second dad, Grady C. Wright, who was born in Florida. So I had the good fortune to have two men in my life that were um, great fathers. And so he also was in, he was in uh, the Korean conflict. And uh -huh. so my mom met him after my dad died. So, mm, okay. you know, so it's just a lot of those roots here. And most of the Black people that you would have met here, say, in the early 50s and 60s, were all kind of related through this sort of southernness, because either they came from Louisiana, Texas, or Arkansas, because that's where, if you were going to muster into the Army, not muster in, but in, be enrolled in the Army, and you were from those states, they sent you to, to Fort Lewis. Like uh, many mm -hmm. people, they ended up in Chicago, or they ended up in other states, depending on where they, their uh, their sort of base was um, mm -hmm. connected to their state. So really? that's how we ended up here. Wow. And my family um, just ensconced themselves. And where's there's, I mean, in Seattle, there's still only 6% Black people. Yeah. Well, yeah. I always say when I leave, I would go places and say, oh, I didn't know there were any black people in Seattle. I said, <laughs> I said well, one less because now yeah. I'm you're like, <laughs> there was 6%. <laughs> so it's an interesting place to be from because it's a lot of outdoor thing and right. did a lot of fishing. And so if you went to my website, you saw those fishing prints. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. And all of that is because that's all we ever did. Wow. So, so life, tell us a little bit about, you know, life growing up in, in Washington state. Um, when, at what point does, you know, art kind of take hold for you and become this, this really, this important part of who Barbara Earl Thomas wants to be? How young do you remember being? Well, I'll just say, and it's really clear to me. I mean, we always made things. My dad was always tearing down our house and then sort of half rebuilding it because you know you get the idea and you get really excited and then you know okay let's do this over here so they were always doing he was always doing something like that my mom you know just we all did out of necessity we 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 made things for our houses we you know embroidered pillowcases we made things to use and so i was just used to making stuff right if you needed something you didn't go to the store necessarily you figured out how to make it Right. So I'm making things, making things for my dolls, making clothes for myself. And um, I think that, that was just a, um, a, a thing to do. You know, second my, nature. Yeah, you just, you know, yeah. you have, and I had a grandfather, he would just he would make his shirts. He made everything except his pants. He would make his ties, he'd make his shirts, and he would make them out of really crazy fabrics. And so it didn't seem, it seemed normal to me to make things. Right. And I think that my first memory of really kind of making something that was, I guess, considered to be art was that I made this image. I don't know what it was, but when my mom got home from work, I gave it to her. Mm. She just seemed so delighted. Yeah. Mm. And I thought, wow, I could mm. just make her happy. So, you know, a few times a week I would make something and then when she'd come home, I'd give it to her. So for me, the sort of the art thing always was about 
this gifting thing. Right. That's beautiful. Yeah. So that was kind of how I got started. And then I went to university. I mean, I always drew. I just drew out as a matter of course. And I right. Right. wrote and drew. And I didn't think it was anything that you did for life. I just thought it was something that I, that I did. Right. Right. And I didn't, and I didn't actually, we didn't grow up with, with, you know, sort of posters on our walls or that kind of thing. I mean, you had family photos of, I mean, I had the typical black family thing. I had Jesus, <laughs> one of the Kennedys, and then all yeah. my grandparents. Uh. One time I thought all those people were in my family. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> that's great i love that this is in your family <laughs> that's so funny when, when my grandmother would get you know kind of we had it all going on like that but um but you know i went to university and then i realized that you could actually major in a thing like this but i didn't ever think it would be something that i, I would do and not do something else and so i've had lots of big giant jobs right um and music festivals i run museums i've done any number of things but always staying in the arts kind of, so to speak the, the, kind of the creative side of things right and, but i always was really interested in the budgets and you know so the, the business side too yeah, yeah the business side you know oh, wow. and how i could get it how i could get yeah. it so, where, now what, so Barbara, let me ask you, where do you think that that came from? Was there, was there this business sense within your family that, you know, it was, it was appealing to you to also see the logical side of a creative career? No, I didn't even, I, I can't say I thought about that. I'd like to say that I was this young person with this big, brilliant, you know, business side. It was just all about logic mm. and, you know, how things happened and what was underneath and what made them work and mm. how, you know, kind of demystifying, you know, how those things worked and, right. and um, seeing if I could take whatever the, the uh, equation was and make it work. Right. And that's what interested me. And, um, and it was, it seemed like a very, you know, interesting way to think about how you relate to the world. And I always thought that my role in what I did in the world was not separate from my artwork, right. not separate from anything I did creatively. And I think that's something that's uh, a little different from what I experience in the art world where you've got your museum over there and you've got your pictures you keep over there. You've got your music over here and you've got your dance over there. Everything in my life is all together. The music, the dance, the, the pictures, Right. they're all interconnected all together and so i was always interested in um context for things right. Right. where they fit how people integrated those things in their lives if i was you know studying something that had to do with caravaggio or somebody i want to look at what's what's happening what are people reading what are people looking at what are people doing in the street around mm -hmm. this crazy art making that's happening and um mm -hmm. Cause that's what makes it make sense. Yeah. It's like a creative ecosystem where everything yeah. feeds off of each other. Yeah. And it's not segmented. It's not, you know, things pulled apart, but it's actually working intertwined. In yeah. And that's why I think that what you guys do, and I'm not kidding. I mean, I, I think that um, educators, um, teachers are kind of the conduit with, that help young people growing up see how things fit that you know? show those connections in a way between the things yeah how yeah. Things together uh why one thing is perhaps not visually related but sort of symbolically related to another thing mm -hmm. so that's what I, I i like about making and taking things apart and i always like to my dad used to you know my parents would bring me things like erector sets and um you know boats and planes that you put together yeah and I never wanted to follow the instructions I was wanted to see if I could put it together in my own yeah mm. well, it was it's interesting that you say that Barbara because I you know when we were talking earlier in the week we all agreed on this philosophy of 
creative people and artists being problem solvers exactly. and how they're creative problem solvers. How important is that for you in your role as an artist to be a problem solver? Well, I think that the, the, in my, it's the only thing that's interesting to right. me. It's yeah. like every day you wake up and you have so many givens, you know, you figure out, it's all about choices to be, it's all about making decisions and you first, your first decision and whether you think it's passive or it's an active decision, what are you going to put on? Mm. And where are you going to go and how's your day going to unfold? And what are the things in your, what are the things in your day that are mysteries that you have to solve yourself? For some people, maybe it's like, how do I get dinner? Yeah. Right. How do I get food in the house today? Or how do I uh, make this acquaintance with that person over there who is actually going to perhaps help me do this other thing I want to do? And, um, and, you know, if you have enough things that are in place, then you can maybe bring some of your mental energy to bear on solving that problem. I think what happens to us in our culture when we have so many people, like right now, we have lots of homeless people, mm. we have people who are just, you know, struggling and it's because they don't have enough givens. Yeah. So they can't solve for the problems they have. Because too many factors. Too many factors. I mean, you know, if you're living in a tent under the, you know, under the bridge, trying to figure out how you basically are going to get up. Housing becomes just too much. So maybe all you can think about is how you get food for that day or how you take a shower. You don't, you just don't have enough givens to, to think yeah. about those big things. So I think for myself, when I come here to the studio and this is a place that I'm lucky enough to have that's separate from my home where I live, I get to come here. And um, the only thing that happens here is I make things, I make up stuff. I, I think about how to um, solve like a project, you know, I'm, I'm working on. And sometimes when I was, when I had these large jobs, I think about, well, I need $50,000. How, uh, how do I set up the, the matrix for getting that, for that organization? Right. And then in a way, they're just not, for me, they're not different things. They're just uh, something I need to figure out a, steps and then right. the other thing that you i think we do is that you think about um i mean whenever i come in i think that the whole possibility that i may fail tremendously is always right there right right and so my my goal is always to push my process and my thought process right to the edge mm. So that I'm learning something, but I don't have so many things on my plate that I am going to have to fall apart and then start all over again. Right. And so that's what I'm I'm holding, you know, again, back to that thing, having so, enough given so that you can put some of your brain power toward that one thing you're trying to solve or those two things you're trying to solve. Right. And um, if it's, you know, how you're making this series. I always tell people the first thing you think of, you know, my idea for a show or my idea for a series, it's normally not the thing that it turns out to be. It's just the thing that gets me in the door. It's like the spark that fuels it. And then I'll start to think about something and then all of a sudden it will not be, but I, but you need that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You hold on to, and then you find it, ah, as you're working, ah, this is what I'm really doing. This is what this story is really about. Then you can let go of that little intro and be in the idea and be in the idea and trust that if you come every day and you push yourself through the drawing or push yourself through the cutting, push yourself through the fact that you're not quite sure how those colors are gonna actually work. But if you work on it, that's where the solution is. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It isn't in. For me now, I don't know how other people work. Some people are really like they're the they're the people who like if they're gonna write a story, they get the outline and they mm. go big Roman numero, yeah, one two three and the A B C and then the second Roman numero and the big. Uh, I just don't work that way. I get kind of the idea, and I have kind of, kind of you know sort of like my key tenet, and then I just jump in. And it's, then it's more organic. Yeah, then it becomes like 
this. It's for chaos. It's, it's, it's that, that it's that fuel. It's, 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 it's chaos. It's kind of chaos. And there's a chaos theory, you know? Yeah. All things whirl around and then you see your solution just momentarily. And you if you can move quick enough, you can seize that. Mm. Right. Um, and then you have some resolution and you can bring the image up or you can bring the solution up. And um, I think that that is kind of how I, I like to work. That's why this whole thing with COVID and everything and what's happening did not um, stress me out maybe as much as it did a lot of other people because I'm so used to dealing with, I don't know. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and trying to solve the, I don't know. Right. I don't yes. know. You know, I, I mean, I actually can, can say that I don't know is a valid response to something. Right. It, yeah. it really is a valid response. And, and, and then hold it, that discomfort, because it's quite painful. Yeah. And uh, for some people, like right now, we're, we're being told, you know, you need to kind of, you know, stay in your bubble and not wander too far out, even though you're tired and you're a little stressed because we've been in our bubble since March. Uh, I'm like feeling like, you know what? I can, I can handle this. I can hold on to this a little bit longer because I can see all the work that's happening around me to help us get out of this. Mm -hmm. So my job is to hold on in the midst. And, em and embrace it and learn to yeah. embrace it. Yeah, and, and just- And don't it. fear the unknown. And, and, and be uncomfortable. Yeah. Right. Be uncomfortable. It's 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 really this. It's really the, the normal state of things, and that's why I think being an artist is um, it, it's sort of a perfect place for me because also I like to think about things. Mm. I am just I feel very honored to be able to be in a situation where I can just come in this place every day and sit around and think about how I'm going to get myself out of these things I've said I'm going to do. Oh, you apply for things or people off ask you to do things and you go, oh, great, I got it. And you tell all your friends and they go, that's so great. That's so wonderful. Then you got to do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a bummer. It's <laughs> <laughs> all great. People pat you on the back and you say how wonderful you are. And then you don't have to do it. That's it. Yeah. Right. Right. It's, it's so interesting to hear you say this, Barbara, because we have so many students who you know, because they're in their teens, they, everything has to be perfect right off the bat. And yeah. they don't know how to embrace that unknown. And they're very worried about quote unquote failing at whatever it well, is that they fail. do. You know, right. I think that what I tell people, when I was teaching a little bit, I didn't teach very much, but I said, you know, I call that the masterpiece syndrome. Yeah, right. The masterpiece syndrome. And what's really hard about the masterpiece syndrome is when you see the things that you love and you like, you just see that thing, you know, like I have this thing, let me bring this right out here. So this is one of my Santa Lovers. Wow, that beautiful. Kind of yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. It's not yet sandblasted, so it's not, I, I collaborated with a glass maker on this and we planned it and made it and then I put in the sandblasting on it. But I think what happens is, especially now in this electronic age when you can make every, Thing perfect in the computer mm. um, people see that and that's what they go for that's what you want they don't see all the steps that you know someone's gone through to write that song or mm. to create that dance or how many hours they had to spend with their collaborators you know sort of getting that one move that just looks so smooth yeah, yeah. same thing for playing an instrument you know? they're too concerned with the end result well, you know, and so they, or that's what they, they want to be able, and also because you can dress like the thing you want to be, and you can go in the dance of the thing you want to be, but it doesn't quite show to the, to the person all those steps, and that the steps actually can't be skipped. Maybe there's a rare one or two people on the planet who just show up, and they got it all together, and they're singing perfectly or they're doing whatever perfectly but mostly that's not true right the, the right. steps and are an important thing absolutely in, in everything back, in life it goes back to what mk and i tell our students all the time about how important the journey is as much as the destination is yeah and you don't want to lose out on the experiences that that journey brings you and i think that also i mean i because i write i kind of connect the writing to like what i do 
with my uh, images. And I, the part that I love the most is the editing. Editing. Mm. You know, it's a part where you get the whole thing together, and then you got to go back. And it, or, or let's put it into. I put it a little more clear. It's like when you have somebody build something for you, like your 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 house. Yeah. The mastery is in the details. When yeah. someone goes back and they do that really beautiful finish work. Yeah. And then they get those mitered corners and they get all the stuff just right. They clean it up and everything is just so straight and it and they are taking such detail, such care with all those details that when someone steps into the room, they go, God, this is beautiful. Well, yeah, they see the big open structure, but what they're also not seeing, but they are experiencing is all of those refined details that they don't see if they're yes. a carpenter, if they're not doing fine carpentry work, you know, but if you're a carpenter, you walk over and you see how the corners have gone together. You see the fine pieces of wood and what they've used and how they've made those things work. And, you know, you just feel. And everybody notices that, but they don't realize, like you're saying, they don't realize that they don't. Realize it. it's a feeling that they have. And, you know, yeah. and so someone walks in and the room's fine. They, they got it all up, but they decided not to take much care with getting the things straight and maybe not painting the walls very well. Same, same structure, just a different experience. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I love and that. So that's what I'm trying to do with my work. I go back and I might wake up in the middle of the night and go like, it's not on, it's of. And I wake up and I change the word. Then yeah, I come yeah. back and I always tell people it's not over until I, someone takes it and put it in the frame or, I mean, what I love when I'm on Facebook, I mean, that thing when I learned about edit, I write something and I go back, oh no, this is what I want to say. I edit, I edit my- You edit your Facebook? <laughs> sometimes 20 times. Oh, you wish that everybody would edit their Facebooks. <laughs> That word doesn't look for that is not what I meant. And I go back in uh, after people listen. Oh, I like that. Well, now you're gonna like this better. Uh, well, yeah, you're the you're the finisher, Barbara. You're the I finisher in art. You're the finisher in in writing. Tom is my finisher in writing. He's my yeah. proofreader. He's I my, do a uh, lot of a lot of MK's proofreading. Yeah, he's well, you my. Need, you need those people who you know. I don't do my own proofreading, but I will do a lot of my editing. So sometimes I'll send it to my editor. She'll clean it all up and then send it back to me. Then I can see it because all of my crazy typos and things that I didn't mean to say, or she'll change it to something. I said, no, you changed it to something I really didn't mean to say. Right. And so then we go back and forth like that. And so we have a very lovely. That's great. <laughs> I think, you know, though, Barbara, I think that it, it speaks to the humanity of the arts is that we want to see that human hand in there. We want to see those nuances that go in there. We don't want everything made by an algorithm or a machine. And so the, the piece that I sent you today that I just opened at the Seattle Art Museum where you saw the room with all the cuts. Mm. Every cut is done by hand. And I can look at that and I can actually recognize uh, each right. one of these cuts. I can say, oh, that's Maddie. Oh, that's, you know, Peggy. Oh, that's, you know, um, Emily. And it's just amazing. So this piece here, and then the walls in the back, they're all cut by, um, you know, three or four or five different people. Yeah, and you can see, you, you, you know, when you look at that, yeah. who did and who did what. And yeah, it's, just, it's like, you know, you can look at a, a paper that a kid's given you and you know it's his because it's his handwriting. Yeah. Right, right. And so that's what, but for the viewer who walks in, uh, that person is going to see, and this is what the room actually looks like. It's beautiful. It's yeah, beautiful. it's beautiful. Feet, and each one of those um, walls is hand cut and it's done by a group of us that, you know, worked on it from like, like say like November until like, I don't know. Wow. wow absolutely beautiful really it's like it's so surreal too it, and so just... and so delicate but yet so strong at the same time yeah delicate that's a, yeah that's definitely and, true and again i think again that's like the metaphor of, of just being a human being there's something very um solid about us and something that's very strong about us but there also is 
are those points of weakness where if you do one thing wrong, you, you break a leg, you uh, get run through, you know? So those things are a part of like what you want. This is what I want my viewer to sense the sort of the, the, the strength, but also the fragility of, mm. of the piece that I'm making and how light animates that yeah. and uh, brings it alive and changes how you see it based depending on how it's lit and uh, what your vantage point is mm. when you're, uh, cause that piece that you saw there, the, the piece that's the whole thing, it's like 12, they're 12 feet. That's 12 feet tall. Wow. And, um, all the walls on the side that I've cut. So I've lit that one from the top down and I've lit the walls from the bottom up and yeah. it create a kind of, um, to create a kind of drama. Yeah. Create an environment and mood that allows the person that I am, my audience, a chance to stand inside my idea and to find not what I found, but to find what he or she has found. You know, what do mm. you see? So this is right. the, the niches in, but you can see um, how oh. I had this idea of, 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 of like a water fountain. And so you can see the thing twirling like this and then it meets the other, but no, no two panels is the same. They're all right. different, except right. that they all have like, you know, this central sort of idea, you know, the, the twirls at the bottom are go up to, I think it's 26 inches. And then after that, you know, you know, I've divided the page up. And so different people can cut on it as long as we meet at those, you know, basically those points, it's all going right. to so you're give you'll give you, your team like certain guidelines like like twelve inches up and points where you want them to meet. But as far as let's say like these individual triangles that they were looking at here, it's really the hand of the person that's cutting yeah, it. The person, I said, no, I want them to go this way. Sometimes you're cutting it for just whatever reason. You'll turn the the thing around and it looks like it's going the other way. No matter, yeah. just make it. But you make it go out, and then I, you know, what's giving people arch because what they're looking at when they're cutting it's on a flat piece it's on a flat table and it's not standing up so what they see is one piece at a time yeah right. so the people that went to the show today that were part of the team today was the first day they saw it all together wow and that's uh, incredible could, could kind of understand what the group effort was about and to me that again is why, if you are doing something with other people and they're depending on you to have sort of a vision, you know, you want them to feel like, you know, I have enough of a vision here to get us where we need to go, but we're all, we all have to do our part. Yeah. Everybody's, sounds pulling, like everybody's pulling the train. When yeah, I hear you, when I hear you speak, you're, you're really, I mean, obviously you're, you're an exceptional artist, but you're an, exe an exceptional human being and like you're, you're the art director for this, which is, yeah. you know. And I, you know, I told him, I said, I, I'm not quite sure exactly, but I got a good sense and yeah. I'm going to actually, I'm, I show up for the surprises. I, yeah. the surprises happened when we did the install, you know, those returns, you see how the niches were. Then we were doing this part where you make the return back to the wall. I mean, just right on the spot, we decided that we were going to use these the, um, the discarded panels that didn't quite work to make the returns, but how we cut them. We decided that right there at the museum. Mm, and then wow. I got a knife and the poor registrar, bless her heart, the registrars, they, just, they can't bear it. And they said, well, what are you going to do? I said, well, we're going to cut these and we're going to place. I said, you just go in the other room and pretend like you didn't hear me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is you know, we cut and then we, you know, put it in place. And I said, so that's our solution. Right. Wow. We need a solution. Mm -hmm. We need to have these return and make them look really good and have them look like they match up with the arches at the top. And again, there was a problem. We needed to solve it. And um, I needed to tell those four installers what we were going to do. It was my piece. I needed to make a decision. Yeah, yeah. Right. You're the and boss. I made a decision. And then when they put it up, then the guy goes, I had no idea where you were going. I said, well, thanks for coming along. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, Barbara, let me ask you. It's, it's so refreshing to hear an artist talk about the need to be intellectually stimulated 
when they're working, that it's not just a physical act, but there is this, this mental engagement with the work. How important is that for you personally to always be intellectually and or mentally stimulated by what you're working on? And what happens? Is there a time where you don't have that spark with the work and does that affect what you're doing? Well, I have, I have two or three things that happen. I'll come to the studio sometimes and I think no matter what I touch, it's going to be so good. It's going to be so good. I'm not going to be able to stand myself. <laughs> there are those days. And then there are the days where I'm like tired. I'm just like, so like, you know, my, my brain, maybe who knows, I didn't sleep or I just don't know. I have things that I, then I have what I, I call process work. I can just measure things. I said, okay, I need 20 things like this. I can do that. Mm. You know, I can do that with this flabby brain I'm having right now. Yeah. But, but I actually shouldn't be trying to cut something really fine. Yeah. Yeah. And it's kind of like Tom, when we spoke to Bisco yeah. Smith a couple of weeks ago, he had that mm. very same mindset where like, if he's not feeling the artwork or he's not feeling there are other that things, great, there's other do. things, stretching canvases, yeah. Yeah. priming canvases and, and more the, of the, the labor yeah. stuff. And, and you got it. Those are, those are things that have to be done. Yeah. Right. And I'm in here and I just kind of go, okay. Um, you know, and let's face it, I'm dealing with the knife. So when I was finishing um, things for this show, I was really tired, but I really needed to finish. So I did not have the luxury. And I think we talked about it. I said, normally when you're cutting, you don't start to cut yourself until about the fourth hour. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you yes. don't start to cut yourself, you know, and that's just, it's just something that happens. I thought it was just me, but then I had, you know, three or four people here and we're all cutting around the table. And then Peggy, she cuts herself. Then Abby, she cuts herself. And I said, hmm, it seems like after the third or fourth hour, we all start to cut ourselves. Yeah. And because there's a fatigue that happens yeah by the hand even though, but you're not feeling it you're feeling like you could just go but you forget to move your hand quick enough yeah. and i do this because i am a painter so if i'm really tired i'll do this i'll start pulling on the blade oh. Um, oh. like it's the end of, of the, the bristles up. yeah bristles. and so like that last day I, I was cutting myself i cut myself kind of up and down here because i just couldn't remember not to do that luckily yeah. stick it in my mouth to try <laughs> oh. Um, so I, I you know so there's something you just have to work through and I got through but it was like it was exhausting yeah and, um but I needed to get done and I actually I wanted to get done more than I wanted to do anything else so I didn't allow myself the um luxury of going I need to go take a rest yeah right. but still staying bit still staying busy yeah, um, yeah, I just try to tell my kids if you're not moving forward, you're moving backwards. Or and you're I feel like, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's that's kind of what it is. And also, I, I think that a lot of times with people and kids, they stop too soon. Mm. You know, you're when you're you get discouraged and you're just about ready to make a breakthrough, but you you lose faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you lose faith. But you know, you need to keep working and keep working because there's a point where all of a sudden the work starts to work for you. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Work for you. And if you can get to that point, then you have something. Mm. Right. And right. If you do that enough times in your life, you realize that you're always going to get, you always have that process where you start out, you don't know, you don't know, you kind of got an idea, then it looks way different from your idea. Then you realize, oh no, this is the real idea. So I got to go with that now. And then I start cutting or painting or whatever I'm going to do. And then it looks like crap. And then I go like, nope, this is going to be okay. This is going to be good. It's going to be okay. I, I got to have faith. You know, I think I can. I think I can. I need a Thomas is a tank engine. And then you get there and you go, look, this, that looks good. Yeah. Or it's, or sometimes I do a piece and I think it's, um, it's, it's, it doesn't necessarily have the magic, but it's absolutely competent. It's mm. absolutely Right. well done it just doesn't have that thing when you see it you just kind of go ooh, that's just that that came through me i don't know how i did that mm, right. i'm gonna go back and i'll read something i wrote and i go that's really good i don't remember how i got there mm, right but i think for the students and one of the things i tell people i said get your skills down yes learn how to draw mm -hmm. learn how to you know you know if you're singer 
to do your whatever your scale your scales yeah learn how to actually be in charge of your instrument your fundamentals yeah because then it's like it's like grammar it, you, once you learn that you can write any kind of sentence you want but if you have to always depend on the happy accident that becomes um i don't know it's just it's just too exhausting mm, yeah. so i pretty much know i can draw anything i want i can kind of put together figure out certain ways to put things together and so then I can, once I have all those givens, then I can go try something really hard. Yes. You know, right. Exactly. Because that's enough things that I do know. Yeah. Right. right. And I, you have, it's like, goes back to what we said in the beginning. It's those givens that you have, you have yeah. those givens. And so you know? I think that's what I try to get. And also this is a kind of an exercise in patience because I think right now we are dealing with a patient's deficit disorder mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. every Thing and everybody wants everything done really fast. And I don't know if you've ever been any place where you know you've gone to a reading and somebody's worked for five years on a book and they're reading you their book that they just worked on for five years and people are saying, but what are you doing now? Right, Wait yeah. a minute, I just wrote this book, it took me five years. I'm here to read you like a paragraph or something. You're gonna buy it. And you're asking me, what am I doing? What am I gonna do? Let's be right. here now and be in the thing I'm present. I'm yeah done because it's it that's too that's really connected with consumerism like we consume everything we we consume you know the tv program we consume the music and so we don't always hear it and we don't always hear all of the things that have gone into making it such a wonderful thing that to listen to whatever it is you like you know mm -hmm. sometimes i'll listen to something and i'll go like wow that is just so wonderful mm -hmm. and then later on i'll be able to hear how parts of it are connected to other sounds that I know that I've heard, but that person's put those sounds together a little bit differently. Right, right. Now let me ask you, Barbara, is that is that the allure of the material that you work in? Because I mean, for those of you who aren't familiar with what Barbara does, the she she has her hands in so many things, but what attracted MK and I to her originally are these beautiful paper cut pieces. You know, you refer to yourself in, in you know in the interview just now as as that you're a painter and that your background is background is painting where did the paper start to come into your practice because they are just absolutely beautifully crazy. done they're crazy yeah well i think what we talked about was that i had um been had this opportunity to go do um a workshop at the T tacoma glass museum Mm -hmm. And I got to work with these really fabulous glass blowers and glass makers. And because my work, as you can see, is really a lot about light and yes. how it the eye and all of that. I came back here and of course I'm in my studio and I don't have those people. I don't have any of that. And I just wanted to see how to make light be something I could pull up without having all of those people with me. So I thought, well, I can kind of figure that out. I can figure out what the drama is. And so I started cutting up pieces of paper and putting them together. And I said, oh, that looks pretty good. And, and also I wanted it to be a, a thing that I could um, edit. You know, when you're painting, it's really, it's, it's a harder, it's, it's a harder thing to do. And I wanted to be able to do things very physically. Yeah. And, um, and actually, because I had had a, a number of public art works that I had worked out my design through sort of this sort of paper assembly when I would make kind of my maquettes or make my designs. It just it was the natural next thing. And it allowed me to step out of the preciousness of what happens when you're painting because it's 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 kind of a it's got such history and it's it's got such a precious kind of um, you know, sort of atmosphere around it. So mm -hmm. I decided to, um, I decided that I was um, going to simply just get these big pieces of paper and then start cutting them and not have them be precious so that I could actually, um, I don't know, I could actually not be worried when I just took them and I threw them away. Right. And tossed them. So 
that was where the paper came in. And I thought, you know, then I had, I, I saw the, I saw this Swedish lady that came here and she was doing this little Swedish paper cut tradition. You know, they cut all the little, mm -hmm. the little gnomes and things in the paper. Yeah. She was yeah. at a museum. It was like maybe seven years ago. And she was just cutting these things, but she was using little scissors. Mm -hmm. huh. and I went and got little scissors. I had to make <laughs> little scissors, but my hands are too big. <laughs> she had little Swedish hands. I had larger hands. I don't know. <laughs> So I said, I think I better use a knife because I can't do the little scissors. And it turns out that because this is kind of like a pencil, yeah, my perfect instrument is my perfect yeah. instrument. So it, um, I, then I, I said, you know, you can make the thing that goes on top and put the colors underneath and move the light around. And um, it's a beautiful concept, Barbara. It really is. It's, 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 you know, what? it's, it's, it's got my head spinning now with, Everything that you've talked about so far about how you grew up and the environment that you were in and you being in a family of makers. makers. Do you, yeah. Do you yeah. think, though, now now that I'm looking at it and trying to make that connection, do you think this is this is kind of like the natural progression for you as a maker? Like you have this background of making things with your hands and sometimes I know as a painter, you don't always get that same feeling when you're painting. Do you think that this was just something that would have naturally evolved where you were physically making things anyway? Well, I think for me, because I, I am a storyteller and I also like my, one of my favorite art forms is theater. And so like, that's what I'm missing right now mm. is just the theater at will, you know, like yeah. I was here and I go like, well, you know, it's, you know, five o'clock. I wonder what's on at any, I mean, I just would get in my car and go to a play, any old play. And it could yeah. be a bad play or a play, just go. And I just like the idea of stepping inside of sort of a dialogue or a conversation or something that's happening that someone's dreamed up and you're trying to figure out the logic, what's going on behind that character. So for me, my paintings, I was like, I would like to, I would paint these things and I said, I wonder what's behind there, what's back there. I bet I could build something and put myself in it. And I want it to come off the wall. I, I said that, I said, I need to come off the wall. I, I It's just too flat. I really need it to be 3D. Mm -hmm. And so that was my impetus was to be able to make it. And that was my first problem. I said, how can go. we make these big enough? So in, in people, it's, it's counterintuitive that it's easier to work on something that's almost your size and yeah. just something smaller and you know, it tightens you up yeah it's one fifth your size or one tenth your size so yeah. when you started cutting figures that were my size and bigger it just i could it i could see it better mm, and yeah. i wanted to step inside of it and then i would get people who knew how to build things and they'd come over and we'd build things together and um, then i figured out how to do my part and i since i'm a smaller person i needed things that i could carry around so paper worked pretty well and yeah. i could pull, pick this up i could do this right by myself and but it was it's good to have people helping me so having those people at sam uh, seattle art museum the installers was so great because they had the tools they had those little lifts yep. yeah Not yeah the, the ladder me going up on the 12 foot ladder and <laughs> like, what are you doing up there I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what what type of paper are these made out of that they could be so tall and cut so delicately and still hold together? That's Tyvek. You know, oh, okay. that's yeah, that's yeah. The house with. Yeah. That doesn't have the big word on it. Yeah, it's not that. Yeah. yeah. And um, you can get in these big rolls and I just, you know, and that's another thing. It's just like I get the roll and it's not precious. You just start cutting it. You make a mistake. You go like, okay, nobody died. Just roll with it roll with it, unroll it, cut it again. And um, so I like that. I like that. Um, I like the facility of not having the material be necessarily precious, but what I do and what I make it look like becomes the precious thing. Mm. Yes. I was just going to say that it's a transformation. Yeah. And that's what art is. You're adding value to something that may necessarily not have the value. Yeah. You're upscaling. That word, that transformation is what art is, is not is you take the idea, you take the thing, and you push it till you make it into something 
that relates to what it was, but is not that thing. Mm, right. Love it. So my portrait, it's not that, oh, I took the idea of a photograph and I translated just that photograph and all that, 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 but what I did was I pushed the image until it referred to itself, but it was no longer itself. Mm. And that yeah. piece right here uh, it's called Holding Fire. And um, the, the model for that was a young friend of mine. Her name is Leilani Lewis. And she came and I took, I've drawn, just drawn her a lot. You know, I just have drawn her. So I, I um, actually, this is a redo of one I did earlier because I sent one away and I said, I still need that. <laughs> so I went back and I redid it. And, and in the second creating of it, it looks a lot more like her and feels a lot more like her because I was now so familiar with um, drawing her over and over again. Mm -hmm. and my, you know, my, I, I solved several problems in rendering her so that I had fewer things to solve and defining, making the image look like her. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you rework a lot of your pieces, Barbara? Is there, a, is there a lot of transformation during the process? Yeah. Well, I might draw the same thing like 12 times. Yeah. So that by the time it gets to the piece you saw, I mean, I have drawn her like, you know, 10, 15 times. Yeah. So I know how to draw her. <laughs> and by drawing too, you're meaning cutting. Well, I cut. Well, your cutting cut, is your drawing. I, do, I have actually drawn her with a pencil. Yeah, yeah. I cut her out with a paper. I've done everything. And I, I don't know if you ever refer to the book, uh, The Shape of Content by, um, what's his name? Uh, having ben Sean. Ben Sean, having the right material for the idea that you're trying mm. to work on. And I took that to heart. And that's why I ended up in all these different art forms is because there are things that can happen with glass that are appropriate and that make the glass can do better than anything else. And there's things that can happen with paper that paper that you can't do it with anything else better. There's something I can do when I translate it to steel that once it goes from the paper to the steel, it's no longer the paper idea. You know, it's it's its own thing. But I have mm -hmm. ideas in advance so that when I make the transfer out of the original sort of drawing, it's not, you know, I, I'm not worried that it's not looking exactly like the thing I right. referred that from which I've, it's been referred. Mm. And that's it, evol it evolves on its own almost. Yeah. It's just so fun. Yeah, that's I mean, it's 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 so refreshing, Barbara, to hear you speak this way about your work, because we have our students who become so locked in on one specific style or one specific technique and they don't want to take the opportunity to see how it evolves or to investigate it or sustain this um this whole process of pushing the envelope and like you said taking it to the edge and seeing where it can go where do you get that inspiration from how do you pull that out of yourself cool <laughs> You know, I, I really, I mean, so let me talk about the uh, the flip side of it. You know, I look at some of my friends who, you know, they've got their, their thing down, they, they are a painter or they, you know, they make these beautiful, you know, objects and, and they just get, you know, they just are in that thing. And so people walk in, they know what they're going to see, they expect that thing and they get that thing. And then, you know, I, I feel like for me, it's like, oh my God. I really want to do this paper thing. I really, I really had to work hard to figure out how my paper cuts work fit into that big giant room I, I built. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 it and it does all tie together, but um, you know, you just never want to be a, a, a dilettante. Mm. So you gotta try to figure out how to do it really well. Yeah. Right. So that it, you know, because like this, the kid, I also have an idea of what's good. And, you know, they're, they're, they're struggling against the fact that they can see the thing that's really great, but their skills are not up to their idea at all. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We see yeah. that a lot. Yeah. So, a lot. And I said, you know, what you want is your skill and your idea to just maybe be that far apart because mm -hmm. that's the part where you have to chin up. But if your skills down here and your ideas up here, 
you're always just hitting right there and you're just get too discouraged. So, you know, get rid of that, you know, get rid of that thing that, and, and just work where you are and then go to the next step and you can't skip steps. I'm sorry. Oh, I love that. Oh my God. That yeah. was, that like just hit, that hit home with me because we have, when we see it all the time, right, Tom, we have students oh, that have yeah. these grand ideas, like grand ideas. They just don't have that skill set yet. But they and want it done. And they also, they want it done. Yeah. They, you know, they don't done. realize that. I love that. Don't skip steps. You know, yeah, and, yeah. You know, and I say to people, I mean, if you want to be, a, you know, great, you know, you can relate. You want to be a great basketball player. You see those those guys, they've been out there on the court and they've been doing that since they were eight years old. It's and, not happening by accident. You know, it's not by accident. It's not just they put on the tennis shoes and the shorts. And so you can see that. You see that. But when you're doing something like maybe art or you're doing something like anything else that where the, the, uh, the steps are not apparent. Yeah. Mm -hmm becomes more difficult to appreciate um, all the things you have to do to, to master your craft. And I think that um, also getting that critic off your shoulder, that one that's going, it's not good, it's not good. <laughs> I mean, you have to work long enough so that you forget that you're working. Yeah. And that's actually, to me, that's where the magic is. When you can get into something where it's like, if you, I don't know if you've ever written, kids have written a paper or you've been reading a book and you look down and you look up, you know, three hours later, you have forgotten that you're doing that thing, but you're so engrossed by it that you forget that. that Everything thing. melts away. Yes. Yeah. And that is the, that is kind of the, the mystical part of the making. It's mm -hmm. doing what you love too. Yeah, and you know, and and you know, for that to happen for me, it doesn't happen that often. But because it has happened often enough, I'm like the rat on that little, you know, for that little pleasure. Yeah, shot. keep going, yeah. keep going. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I keep coming back. I said that's gonna happen, boy. I, if I can get that little feeling, that's a hit. And it's yeah, like the endorphin hit or whatever. You just get that, and you know that you've touched some sort of mystical. It's, point. it's so funny because. I feel like I, I just keep referring back to Bisco Smith, Tom, and like you guys, you know, two different paths, two completely different styles of art. But when he was talking about the levels and the levels yes. that he's trying to reach, and it was exactly for like himself, what you, for himself, yes. it's exactly like what you're saying. It's like that, that you just love that feeling so much. It's like what you're working to get. You don't feel it all the time, but when you do, and that's what you always, you're you know, striving to get. And you know, you've touched something that is, um, you know, I don't use these words lightly, that is divine. Yes. There's yeah. something divine about merging with everything around you and not individuating, but knowing that your existence is part of this, you know, this mm. expanse and mm. that you're pulling energy and uh, information in from all these different channels. And I'm really careful about the things I put up on the wall around me. I, everything that's up here on these walls, they're here because I want them mm. to, to yes. inform you too. Inform me, influence me mm. because I am like this little sponge. And if I see something and, you know, all of a sudden it'll show up in something I'm making, I said, Where'd that come from? I look down at them. It's part of the design on the rug, it's part of the <laughs> wall. And this color wheel, that piece right there, when I that piece color wheel, that color wheel was above this boy's head. And I had this like, pinned up on the wall like that. I said, that color was perfect. Yeah. And it's in the place right where it needs to go. Mm. And so those things are um, what come into you. I mean, we're not, you know, eight, you're subconscious. And then everything's just coming in. That's why I say to people, you need to be careful what you, it's like, you know, people like you are what you eat, but you need to be what you read, what you, um, what you let come out of your mouth, what you let go into your ears, you know, all of these things make you who you are. So you really do want to be aware of what you're letting in, be aware of all the things you're hearing because human beings are quite, um, they're sensitive. And it's very easy to become part of, you know, the noise you hear. Um, I think we see that more now than ever. Too. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Yeah, that's so Absolutely. well said. I love that when you're saying about you are what you eat, and it's 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 like everything else. That's that's so true. Yeah. So I'm I'm careful. I mean, I listen to certain things, and if I'm too vulnerable, I'm feeling kind of too tired. I don't let myself listen to certain news things. I don't let myself, or if I'm talking to a friend and they're getting too wound up and they're saying things that are just you know to me that I feel like you know I really need to keep a certain amount of optimism for me to mm. get up and put one foot in front of the other. So I have to make sure I'm not carrying too many heavy things in my backpack mm. so that I can move. And I don't think of it as being um, in denial. I just know what I need to come in here and feel optimistic enough to do something that actually on the face of it doesn't matter. Mm. Mm. Yeah, wow. exactly. so well said. That's, not that's very thing, well said. Not one thing I do is going to necessarily feed anybody or save one kid's life or uh, how house someone. You know, I, I'm not foolish enough to think that, but what I am foolish enough to believe is that if I can do that thing where I make something transformative so that it's in another form that someone can actually take in, you know, they haven't been able to take it in by the journalism. They haven't been able to take it in by the, the report. They haven't been able to take it in by, you know, what other means, but they walk in and all of a sudden I have found this way in. And that is the purpose of what I've done. It's that transformative um, action. And it, to me, that's, you know, the affirmative part of what I do and the part that why it's important to me to hear what people say or what they think and what the image I've made made them think of and mm -hmm. remind them of because I just feel like, wow, I never saw that. Really? Okay. That was interesting. So I, I learned from that and I learned to be able to see better by looking through the eyes of people who are looking at something that I can that you know, I, I don't see, I haven't seen immediately what they've seen. Right, right. Barbara, it's just, it's, it's so beautiful to hear your, that, that human connection that you just, you just need to be around people and you need to connect with people. And when I was looking at your bio earlier this week on your website, something struck me as very, very interesting. And that is your the connections that you had to certain people who influenced you in your past and mentored you in your past. And the one name that came up to me that was very interesting was your relationship with Mr. Jacob Lawrence. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that this that that is a name that resonates in the art history canon as a major person in art history. So I'm just I'm dying to know what did you take from your friendship and your mentorship with Jacob Lawrence, I, I'm just, I would be fascinated to know what that connection was for you and what you took from knowing him. Well, um, first of all, he was a fabulous teacher. Yeah. He loved teaching. And what I learned about that was if you can't be a teacher like that, you shouldn't be a teacher. Mm. For me, I'm like, oh God, he really loves it. I don't love it that much, so I better not do it. <laughs> and, uh, so that was one thing, but also he, he was very clear about what he did. You know, he made this work. He'd been making it since he was a very, very young person. And that was the thing he did. He was a very superl superlative um, skill. He had a skill set that was just incredible. Mm -hmm. He had a, um, a visual, visual, he created a visual vocabulary that allows you to come in and after two minutes be able to figure out what he's doing and take you through the narrative of his, um, of his uh, series. And that was another thing I learned from him or watched him. I said, you know, you, he would, you know, if you see this shape here and it's defining an arm or it's defining a human, he uses that throughout to define that same thing. So you're not confused. It's like your parts of speech. You know, right. not turning the verb into a noun, not turning it into something else. He gives you that thing and it's visually simple. It's, it's, um, it's deceptively simple. Mm -hmm. It's quite 
complicated. And he taught me about editing and, you know, and if it, something doesn't fit and it's not adding to the composition, sorry, get rid of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's something I try to teach my graphic design students. Get rid yeah, of it. Sometimes simplest is best. You yeah, know? And, and also I just about someone who lived at a time he was born in what, 1917. And so he lived through some times that of course I wasn't there uh, and some difficult times. And he kept his, he kept who his, he was. And, mm. and I realized, you know, those are not things that I necessarily had to deal with, but watching someone deal with that in such a great, he and his wife, Gwen, Gwendolyn, they had a kind of grace um, that they met the world with and they treated everyone well, mm -hmm. everyone. Yeah. And you could walk into a room and no people wouldn't know who Jacob was and he'd be over there and then he'd be talking to the janitor because the janitor could look at his work and, you know, he'd be doing the builders or whatever. And he could, you know, see those things. And so he was very interested in that. It wasn't, it wasn't some sort of thing that he was pretending to like to yeah. do. It's what he really liked to do. And I was fortunate to have met him when I was quite young. I was like 18, 19, mm. and knew him until his death, which was in 2000. Mm. And um, had the good fortune to have him be, after being an instructor, also be a friend. Yeah. And, um, you know, and I, it was not a plan. It would just happen, you know, it just happened that way. Yeah, so that's beautiful. I, was able, you know, I would, they, did, they were from New York. They did not drive. <laughs> so I would get in my car and go over and take them to go to the grocery store where they needed to get more than the things they could just carry. Right. You know, now if you come here, you see it's not like me. It's not set up. It's set up for the car. It's not right. set up for um, running to the in corner store and bringing some small thing back. You know, you need to go out and bring it big things in your car and so i'd take them and we would go out on a date you know i'd take them in the car and we would take them to see something they hadn't seen before and you know it was just normal being normal together but you know knowing that he i have to say he never all the years i knew him he never he did a lot of you know critical sort of working with me but he was always able to deliver the news about what i needed to fix in a way that was coupled with something good. You're doing right. this, Barbara, you need to think about that. And I think that um, it, it's clear to me, you don't have to be torn down in order to be built up. Mm. Right. And that's one of the things that he was able to do so that, and he was never trying to create, turn me into a little Jacob. He was just trying to see what is it you're trying to do and how can I help you do the thing you're trying to do? Mm. That's fantastic. Yeah, that, is. Is. Such... that to me was, you know, a gift I got that I didn't know I was getting until after it was all done. Yeah. And after he had died, I realized all the things that he had done for me, he and Glenn, and how much I missed them because it wasn't like, I'm going to go to the trick. <laughs> I'm gonna go be with Jacob and Glenn. I'm gonna go take them to do this. I'm gonna go get them a whatever, and we're gonna go out and do a whatever. And I would only really be aware of how famous he was when we would go out like to a restaurant, mm. and then someone would recognize him and know who he was. There was a, a thing that happened. Um, Henry Louis Gates was in town. And so he was reading from one of his books. So, you know, I got Glenn and Jacob and we were going to, wanted to go out to dinner with Henry Louis Gates. And so we went to this restaurant and there we are sitting at the table. And so we've eaten and everything. And the server comes and she takes Jacob's credit card. And she looks at the credit card. She goes, oh my God, are you? <laughs> Makeup, what? And then Skip Gate says, "Just sign a God." <laughs> That's Just great. God, and um, so those were, you know, things that I got to do. And I, I mean, like I said, sometimes life just affords you a 
a really special, special uh, opportunity. And Jacob and Gwen were those opportunities that became sort of seminal to my yeah. life and kind That's of fantastic. who I am and how I um, see the world in a certain kind of way. And, you know, they were these really famous people and they lived quite normally. Yeah. Was good. So Jacob, um, he's, I mean, he's still in my life. He's still actually, I feel, has this guiding magic that just has, still helps me. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. I can't. I can't believe we've been we've been talking to Barbara for over an hour. But so I, the last thing I want to ask you, Barbara, before we wrap up and let you go, mm -hmm. is this: you have such a beautiful narrative to your work, particularly about the the experiences of, of the African American community. So I want to ask you because you are this problem solver, and because you see the world the way you see it. In your opinion, what can we do as a society? to move past everything that we've been seeing for so long and the struggles that this country is going through with the social aspect and the race aspect, how can we as a society, what can we do to move forward and get past all of this? Well, I don't know if we're going to ever get past it, but mm. I think we can manage it better. Right. And I think we can get past, again, that perfection issue because it ain't going to ever be perfect. Yeah. Right. And if we can let go of that, just in a way, not to say that we're lowering, up, lowering our standards, then we can deal with where we are. And I think that um, part of what I would say is that if you want to figure out how to get from this side of the room to that side of the room, you could sit here and you could make a plan, you can write it out, you can make a map. You could, you know, do all kinds of things, but you could also get up and take someone's hand that's standing by you and you could walk over there and you could see all the things that happened to you as you were walking. Mm. And the action of doing that thing is part of the solution. Mm -hmm. And we have to get to a place where if we're in some sort of conversation that we allow mistakes to happen that someone might say something that is not necessarily the thing that we think is the right thing to say. We don't even know, but to know, to have enough faith that the intention is not, you know, to, to hurt someone right. and that we, but we both carry responsibility. It's not my responsibility to make you say the right thing all the time, mm. but it's your responsibility to be in it with me, mm. to be right. in it. Yeah. And be part of it, and 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 I think that's 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 what what it, what else is the righteous struggle? Yeah, that's right. The righteous struggle, and um, to also have a sense of humor. Uh, so important. Yes. So important. Sense of humor, because you know what, everything that you do is not that interesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's true. And, and it, even if you're great, it's not that interesting. So I think that having I love that. that sense of humor is, um, I wrote this piece for my show and, and it's called The Catechism. I didn't send it to you, but one of the things it starts out, cause I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm sort of religiously quite eclectic only because I'm not religious really in any kind of way like that but i love ritual and i love like trying to figure out why people think the way they do so i, I ended up becoming a lutheran accidentally because i wanted a book that they had and it was called luther's little catechism it was a little mm. book it had some white letters and so i asked asked pastor i said how can i get that he says oh you got to take this class i said then you're going to give me the book he said yeah <laughs> <laughs> so i took this thing and it was called Luther's little catechism. And so I did that. I think it was like eight or nine. And so I thought I learned about litany, you know, and you know, how you, how you solve things in a series of questions and answers. That's how you teach. And so mm -hmm. I wrote one, I wrote this for um, my, one of my shows and the catechism goes like this. The first question, if they were all like you, I'd like them. And I say, this is not a compliment. 
Do you have to lawn, do you have to use a lawnmower to cut your hair? I said, it depends on the day. Um, you're so smart. It must be terrible to be black. I say, that's too deep for me. Uh, I didn't want to tell you, but until after you left, but you're the first person to come over to visit my house and my parents don't like black people. I said, this will be the end of our conversation. You speak fluent English and you're so articulate. Thank you. If you were just one shade lighter, you would have made it. Lord have mercy. Oh Don't work too hard or want too much. I'd hate to see you disappointed. Thank you. Uh, I will consider that. The form asks, what are you? White, Indian, Mexican, Negro, American Negro or black? I am nine years old and I have three choices and 10 seconds to figure out which of these is the least bad thing I can be. Mm. Wow. 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 And I think that, um, that thing about um, don't work too hard or want too much, that was a eighth grade teacher That's said wow. that to me. And even then I wasn't quite sure what was wrong with the phrase, but I knew it wasn't right that a teacher yeah. should tell you that thing. But what he was saying was like, you know, in this culture, you know, if you try to work above your station, you just get, you know, you get done. So I think yeah. that um, we have to get past these, you know, these hurts that we have, and we have a lot. We all have a lot. And, um, and my, my visualization is that I want you off the hook because I want to be off the hook. Right. Yeah. Right. Being on the hook is not interesting. It's very painful. And it's paid for all, for all of us. So I'm just hoping that now we have another opportunity to um, do things together. So part of my process here in the studio is I invite people in. We work together. And like I said on my last conversation with you, when I give the knife to the 15-year-old or the 20-year-old or the 25-year-old or 75-year-old, they say, what if I make a mistake? And I said, it's not what if, it's when. Mm. Right. And when you make that mistake, we'll figure out how to incorporate it in the whole, and it will be part of our relationship, the mistakes that we make together. Yeah. Now, we're just right. mistakes together. That's great. And so yeah. that's what it is. So I hope that you guys in, like, you know, like, real breathing space when we can all breathe the same air. I know. Um, absolutely. I know. Absolutely. It's true, yeah. Barbara. You are you are a a true treasure. Yeah, and, really. And the things that you have imparted to all of us during this session, I think, will carry with us for so long. Thank you so very much for being you. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I, love been... I know that the editing is going to make this really good. <laughs> <laughs> well, MK's got it down. Let me tell you, we had we had no technical difficulties no, this no, week. No, no, no. We are so we are so excited that it will be one of our best for sure. But yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be Barbara great. Earl yes. Thomas. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, and it has been a, a true pleasure getting to know you. Yeah. And talking so to you all so week. It really, it really has, and, and we, we hope to stay in touch with you and, and continue to watch all of your fantastic efforts come to pass. It's just, it's a beautiful thing. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Thank you so much, Barbara. We love you, Barbara. Yeah. Thank you. You are. That's great. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye now. <laughs>